Okay, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Alfonso. Uh, I'm going to be the first part together with Josu of the first uh, session. And uh, well, we, we've been working three years in, in big data. And uh, we hadn't even asked ourselves this question. What comes after big data? Because always in technology, there's always something after, right? So, uh, but we did come across some things that we found that were very interesting. And we said, uh, well, maybe actually these things uh, they're based on big data, and it looks like that they can help in the next wave. So this is what we're going to be talking about. Uh, we just have uh, very early stage startup. We have uh, data scientists and artificial intelligence guys from several places. We've been working on uh, big data on, on corporations for a long time, and uh, we're very, very early. Advisory board from Silicon Valley, which is where all these things we see are happening, at least, the cognitive revolution. How many of you know Ray Kurzweil? OK, so I'm sure some of you have heard about some of the things we're going to be talking about. Ray Kurzweil really, really recommended. Uh, this is the guy that in 1982 predicted that computers were going to be better than humans at playing chess. And he's done many things, right? And basically, you know, for, for many people that are in technology, we all know this, right? This technology, technological change is exponential. And as uh, the digital world is permeating more and more layers, this is, this is uh, making those parts of the businesses also exponential in their way they change, right? And if you see this is, by the way, exponential scale, you know, magnetic data storage is still going up exponentially. So it's safe to think that uh, in the next five years, it will continue going up exponentially. And that means a lot, a lot, a lot of data. So what are we going to do with those things, right? This is one question. It happens also with the fastest possible data transmission speed. So we think we have, you know, 4G is very fast. It's going to continue exponentially. The productivity of algorithms also it goes exponentially up. This is what some of the things that Ray Kurzweil argues, right? So we ask, is this going to be right? And so if you look at all the kind of devices that are coming now, we're going to have things like the biobanks giving data. So that means we're going to have much more data, right? We're going to have pet truckers. That's already something out there. Plant sensors, uh, you know, we, we started our funding. There are already plant sensors that, that uh, tell you about humidity and all these earth conditions. So you know if your plants are going to go well. A lot, a lot of data. Uh, Bluetooth cutlery, I'm sure you've heard about that, actually to track if you eat very fast or very slow, right? And uh, the FDA already approved uh, the first digital pill. It has a chip inside the digital pill. It's approved by the FDA. You can ingest that. And it tracks if you are eating or not uh, the pill, so the doctors can have that. So a lot, a lot of data that is going to come down the road, right? And uh, again, it's, it's well, uh, you know, Relational databases and things like that is what we used to have in 2005, and the worldwide data was 130 exabytes. Now we have 1,200 uh, exabytes worldwide uh, in 2010. That's big data. If you continue with that law of accelerating returns from Ray Kurzweil, and all those things do incline that it's going to go like that, we're going to have in just 2015 11,180 11, exabytes. That's, you know, it's going to be as crazy as we think it is now. It's going to get so much more crazy, right? So the question is, what are we going to do then, right? Are we going to put all that data just in a Hadoop cluster and, and try to get, you know, with some uh, interesting front end like Tableau or something like that that has some cognitive innovation just to try to make sense of that? Is, is, is it going to be like that or is there something else, right? So then uh, the interesting part is you look is uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and especially thanks to big data, uh, computers are beginning to be much better at cognitive tasks, specific cognitive tasks than humans, right? Uh, uh, Watson, how many of you know Watson? OK, so Watson is uh, it's, uh, an IBM uh, system computer that was better than the best human players at playing Jeopardy, which is a game I'm sure you know better than myself. It has metaphors, and you have to ask some questions that are very human, right? And Watson was better than the best human players. So it's easy to think uh, basically how Watson works, and, and there are very interesting articles of how to build a Watson in your basement because it's based on open source. It's a cognitive system. It, uh, when, it, when it receives a question, it thinks about three million hypotheses uh, with big data. It thinks, well, I'm not sure what I understood, but it could be one of these three million things that they asked me. And then it looks for, and if this is the first one of the, those three million were the real question, what would be the answer? And then it validates and gives some weights and actually comes up with something that is better than the best humans at Jeopardy. If you think about that, is if it's good at answering those kind of questions, why cannot, can I not apply those things to other aspects, right? Think about uh, human resources, right? Uh, 
who is the best candidate, right? It can build millions of hypotheses, and maybe it could be better than the best HR recruiter, right? It's it just, just, just things that go there. The same at Google Car. Google Car uses machine learning, and uh, there's some videos there, I'm sure some of you have seen it, about actually it learns about the roads, it scans them, it's safer uh, for the people that have driven it than their own way of driving. Because you know, when you're driving, if you hear a sound, you will look, and if some, you know, a kid comes or something, you, you can run over. But this thing has sensors, and it actually controls all those things, right? So at a specific cognitive tasks, computers are beginning to be better. That's why IBM is talking about uh, cognitive systems as the new revolution, right? And so uh, we think that that is, that is one very interesting thing, because basically what is beginning to happen, and you're seeing it if you're working on big data, is uh, computers are getting so, so much smarter, right? So you will have, you know, your, your people, right, with whatever big data tools getting from the data streams, but you will begin to have <coughs> cognitive systems help those people. Like you have Watsons, right? And of course, they will start small and they will go better and better and better. And again, that can be applied to HR. Hey, we have a complicated project in, the, in this big company of 100,000 employees, right? So uh, who is the best guy to do it? Is Well, there's this guy that I've been tracking. Think about the cognitive system. I've been tracking him. And similar people that we assign to similar things work very well, right? It's reading the email. It's reading how it interacts. So the cognitive system who, who could help HR, right? It's uh, already helping research the same thing. Hey, I need a material that is this kind of material. You could have the cognitive system build out 3 million hypotheses of what material could help them, and again, go down that road, right? So, so uh, we see a lot of potential there, security-wise. I mean, uh, for example, 3D printers, right? Think about uh, when we have 3D printers, we will be downloading models from the internet. And when you download a model from the internet of a shoe, actually, you think you're getting a shoe. But actually, somebody put some malware in the shoe. And that's two chemistry compounds that they will mix over time and make your shoe burn, right? And those things could happen. And you need a cognitive system to actually study the design that you downloaded and think, hey, I think there's something wrong here. Because this is not a functionality I see, right? So uh, the more and the more things we have, those cognitive systems will begin. Because, uh, and I can tell you many examples that have already been happening, I'm sure, if you think in your own lives, right? My car, a very expensive car. You know, it turned out that the security engineers of the company, which is a very expensive car company, actually had forgotten a security flaw in the car that anybody with a device you can buy for $50 in Amazon can hack the car in less than one minute with a generic key and go away with the car, right? So we just humans are not able. We need these cognitive systems to start helping us checking those security things and all those, those kind of things. Uh, so we apply this in, uh, in Sherlock. What we decided is to apply this to, to the enterprise security space, right? Because uh, again, these are probably not you know, linear and exponential. It's, it's a little bit uh, tweaked. But uh, you know, the attack surface, the security issues, uh, when we talk with, uh, with uh, security teams, we have 10, 20 people in the company in security, but it feels like we need 40 people in the team. Not only 40, 50 people. But we cannot afford to hire 50 people to manage security. Well, you cannot afford to hire 30 more people, like in HR. But maybe you can afford to hire you know, a cognitive system that is like a junior HR recruiter or a security guy. We decided to, to work on the security space right, with these cognitive systems to try to bridge that gap. As an example, think about those plant sensors. When you have plant sensors in your company and they're connected to your Wi-Fi, I mean, are you going to have security people check the security and the firewalls because you can be hacked through the plant sensors into your network, right? It's just going to get more and more and more and more like that, right? And uh, so this is how we see it. Uh, would you like to have 1 million security engineers uh, working in your organization? Think about junior security engineers absolutely in every conversation taking care of everything, right? You can model security topics very easily. And uh, security software does some things. You can track the logs of those security software to see the changes, right? Uh, what kind of things could you ask this cognitive software? Well. Uh, if you think, again, about the Watson analogy, which is quite easy to understand, is the same thing as Watson was able to answer uh, your pretty questions better than humans by building hypotheses. Think about asking, hey, what are the main projects in the company? And is my security team really uh, addressing all the security issues in those, main comp in, the, in those main projects? You can actually ask those kind of things, this software. And again, it will build hypotheses. It will scan natural language, all the conversations in the company. And actually, it will come up with, I think these are the answers. Again, it could come with some errors or some others. It will learn through time, right? Is uh, 
who is not following security procedures, right? The, the guys in security are, are extremely concerned about people not following security procedures, and they just cannot track everybody, right? So this could be helping. Uh, please make sure the key security aspects are covered in your projects. So you could also, this can be a reactive system. Uh, uh, it can also react, right? You can ask, actually think about that Siri, right? Hey Siri, please help me. Uh, take care of security in the company. This is what Sherlock would do, right? It's that kind of interaction that you can also have in these kind of cognitive systems, right? Privacy, it's very interesting because uh, the moment you talk about these things, privacy always comes up, right? Well, think about antivirus software. Antivirus software already scans all your conversations if you're in a company, right? All your emails go through antivirus software and you don't feel that your privacy is uh, a threat with that antivirus software, right? As much as you feel with the antivirus software, the good thing about it, this, this would be doing exactly the same thing. It's just uh, a software that is looking at those things. Like when you try to browse some URL and suddenly you say, sorry, you cannot access that URL because it looks like suspicious for the company. If we are wrong, please send us an email. I'm sure you have some of that software in your companies, right? Well, this would be doing the same. Maybe sometimes it doesn't get it right and you have to, hey, you got a mistake, but it would be the same thing. It's very interesting because as these cognitive tools begin to get more and more smart, What's the difference about really being a software being allowed to do some things? And what's the difference of, of being so human and that it actually feels like humans are looking at, at in a cognitive way, right? And uh, so, some kind of for some of the technology guys, again, the architectures in these cognitive systems, I come from the, the enterprise architecture. We all come from the technology traditional architecture layers and, and, and things like that. So the technology layers and the things in these cognitive systems also change. They are completely different uh, components than the ones we're used to, right? So here what we have is you have your company data streams. And basically, you know, the security team is, you know, with their emails, they communicate with emails, uh, meetings, audits, documents. They have reporting tools, right? Basically, how they see the security is through the consoles of the reporting tools. The latest thing is log anomalies, right? You, you track log anomalies with machine learning, right? And so this is kind of, again, very summarized uh, about the architecture of, of, of Sherlock of cognitive systems, right? So basically, you have some kind of uh, natural language processors. And they're very different. Natural language processors for uh, email are very different from natural language processors for documentation, right? So you need to have that. My hat and distance for some documents works. For some others, actually, it doesn't work. So, so that, that was part of the key success of, of Watson. That's what we studied, at least. And, and then after, you will have the signal and the noise about that, that semantic information that you have. You have machine learning topic modelers. So machine learning will be figuring out the topics that people are talking about. Is this a project or is this actually a server? Is this a new document that they're sending about with passwords or not, right? It's very easy for any kind of, uh, of system now to model the domain, right? So we're modeling the security domain. And the security domain metadata is about, it's very, there's a lot of uh, IEE standards, right? Is it a server security thing? Is it an application security thing? Is it a, a data confidentiality security thing? Is it a legal thing? So, so you can match the, machine, the topics uh, with uh, the, the, the security domain metadata and ontologies, right? Then we have the hypothesis builder. It's exactly the same as, uh, as the one from Watson. Basically, it has the topics that is found in the conversations, and you have the security domains. And then it builds millions with big data. You build millions of hypotheses. This system is, is this thing about, is this a new project? And am I concerned about application security in this project? And then it says, well, if it is, let's look at this. Or I'm not concerned. It builds all these millions of hypotheses in seconds, right? You also have the security surface scout engine, which is very important to see new areas, right? Some things will be relevant data. When you put a joke to a friend, that, that's nothing, right? And some things go, will go through the ranking algorithms to actually, as Watson did, the same, it's the same kind of architecture of these cognitive systems, for now at least, right? And uh, which is actually, I believe, this one is, uh, is really the, the good answer. And this is a, a security issue, and it's going not well, right? And then it will process all that, and it will give the relevant security issues to the security team. Think as a, as a junior security engineer, right? If you hire a security engineer junior, he doesn't know all the things that the senior guy knows, but at least you, you have millions of these for the price of, of very few people working on all the data of the company. And this is, this is Sherlock. Thank you. And now I'm going to pass to Yosu, the CTO, to do the, the demo of uh, what it looks like. OK. Thank you. So, uh, with these big data things, uh, it's not only the size of the, of the amount of data. 
but as well the complexity, right? What I used to have a two-dimension vector to characterize my users, what could have, uh, be the full name and the age, for example. Now I can join that with a telephone number, with a shoe size, hair color, height, weight, friends, likes and dislikes, and friends, likes and dislikes, and hair color, and so on. So it becomes much more complex, right? even if the business doesn't change. Take a look at this. 20 years ago, I used to kill uh, the bad guys with six keys, right? Today, I keep killing the bad guys, but now I need 30 keys. It's much more complex, right? So what I need now is something that works with uh, all that dimensions, but when it comes to render the data so I can happily understand, uh, it reduces the dimensions <laughs> and shows me in a way that I can, at a glance, have a, a notion on what's happening, right? So I changed to the prototype, which is, uh, okay. Sherlock has processed uh, 3.5 million documents, right? And he, here we have uh, the knowledge he, he has acquired. This first uh, tab shows us the top most relevant projects within the company uh, regarding the conversation, right? Uh, the bar size means the activity on the conversations, and those buttons uh, is Sherlock asking us what to do for each project, right? The green bar means that there's nothing to worry about, the, the green blocks. The orange blocks means that from all the hypotheses Sherlock has built up on the data, there could be some paths <coughs> that lead to a security risk situation, right? And the red blocks means that there is a present security risk. So the bigger button is Sherlock suggesting what it should do. For example, I have two red blocks there. I can click in, and Sherlock will drill, drill, uh, drill down on, on the project conversation, and we'll start interacting with users, asking more questions, and getting more data, and even trying to fix those uh, risk situations. Right? In this tab, what I have is what is to, uh, people talking about and who is talking about what, right? This first chart shows the, oops, shows the topics Sherlock has found. For example, this bigger one, which means that it's the most active one, has those entities or concepts, right? Sherlock as well uh, gives a score on these five security dimensions, protection, detection, reaction, documentation, and prevention, right? Uh, a smaller score doesn't mean there's a bad thing. I, just a second, I will load the data from a project. Oops. And we will see the same chart, but applied to, to that project, right? I can see a low blue score of 10, which doesn't mean a bad thing, because maybe I put it in an early stages doesn't have, doesn't have a high score on reaction, but if Sherlock finds something wrong, he will display it as this reddish brown color, right? Again, I can ask Sherlock to drill down on this dimension, or if I know it's under control, I can tell him, oh, it's all right, ignore it. Or I can ask Sherlock about more information on that score, right? And here, what I have is the map of knowledge holders, or the de facto, no choice, right? Uh, from the conversations, Sherlock classifies the users as those who most ask or those who usually respond or answers the questions, uh, weights the questions, and labels him as uh, knowledge holders, right? So he could, if, if he finds some question, he could direct that question to the best bet in order to, to have an answer. Right. Here we can see Sherlock's interaction. What is he working on? So for example, he has found this IP address. He knows that the knowledge holders are those both people. And he has sent this kind of email, right? Asking for more information to, to complete or expand his knowledge base. But he can use a more direct uh, way of requesting information, just sending a questionnaire that the user has to fulfill, 
and then send it back to, to Sherlock, right? And in the last step, what we can see is the user engagement, right? Sherlock uses uh, rewards, users, answers with batches. So by using gamification, we are trying to motivate the user because uh, if Sherlock has no answer, he cannot uh, perform his task, right? So getting back to the slide, uh, which is, no, not this one, yeah. This is what we already have seen. This will be a high 3,000 feet overview for the chief security officer. This will be for the security team. This is what's working on, and this is the user engagement. And so, in the end, what we have with Sherlock is that we can have an ear of a security engineer in every conversation. So he can wait it is if the conversation is security related or not, right? By now, you may be wondering if this actually works. So this is the graph of the precision evolution of Watson, what the IBM guys made to win the job party challenge last year, a couple of years. So we can see an evolution in precision, uh, iterative evolution, right? And our situation right now will be the baseline, okay? We have the technology, we have the platform, and now we have to tune and tweak the algorithms and engines to uh, improve performance, right? And that's all. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm on time. <laughs> questions or not? <laughs> Any quick question? Uh, we downloaded the data set from stackoverflow.com, which is a website where people ask uh, programming and technical questions and the community answer. So it is quite similar to email conversation. It's not a real email data set, but... We tried the, the Enron emails, 500,000, you know, it's public data set, et cetera, but it was uh, for other type of things, more on the business layer, and it didn't help as well. Right? Yeah. Any other? Okay, thank you very much for your time. Thanks.